little bit today. Let's say a word of prayer. Father, as we now get to talk to you through your word, we've sung, we've listened to a story, an important one, small sins, big sins. God, sins are sins, and only you are able to rightly understand and judge us according to them. Help us to stay connected to you. And now, Father, for this message, hide me behind the cross, and thank you so much for Jesus. Amen. Amen. I was shopping the other day. It was funny. I first went to uh, Sprouts, where I ran into Matthias and Carolina. Uh, and so we just said hello or, you know, nice niceties, et cetera. And then I kept shopping, and I went to Walmart, and who did I run into? Matthias. Uh, and so it's a good thing I wasn't buying things I shouldn't have been, because, woo, that would have been awkward. Um, but as I was shopping, I ran into Mr. Angry Walmart Dad. And let me tell you, it was really interesting. I was going through my aisles, and, and I don't know how you all shop, but my wife says, hey, listen, if you write down a list of everything you need, and then you just go and, you know, find the things you do, I find that's really kind of boring. I just go through every single aisle, essentially, and I'm like, I think I need that, and I, that's, that looks about right, etc. So I'm going in the aisles, and, and as I'm going, I see, I see a dad, and Mr. Angry Walmart Dad uh, is with two ladies and no less than six children. Um, and I was just like, have mercy. And then I realized I'm about to have a third child. <laughs> mercy. Um, and, and so, but as we were shopping and I was just, you know, doing my thing quietly, he would just go like, get in line and, and stop doing that and get over there. And I was just like, good grief, man, get a hold of yourself. And, and it would it'd be one thing if it was just like one time, but I met him like three different times and every single time he had just scowl on his face and, and with the scowl, he was just saying, like, ah, and just really angry at the children. I was like, good night, brother, keep it together. Um, but then as I was leaving the store, I was like, man, maybe he's just really having a rough time. My first instinct was like, dude, what's your problem? And so I just thought nothing of it and just kind of went on through my day. But afterwards, a couple of days later, I was here talking to one of our moms as I was dropping off my little one to school. And, you know, we just started talking about how things are going, how's life going, et cetera. And she's like, yeah, you know, sometimes I'm in church and people are talking to me. And I'm like, man, I've got, I've got multiple kids. And she's like, I've got four boys and four boys equals mob mentality. So she's like, I, I can never really be focused on the conversation because I've got all these kids everywhere. And I was just like, wow. And she just kept, we just kept going on about life, et cetera. And she said something as we kept talking. She says, man, sometimes the pressures of life overwhelm us and we break down. And the moment she said that, I immediately thought about Mr. Angry Walmart guy. I was like, oh, maybe that's what happened to him. Because she was saying, just imagine all the different challenges that you're going through with kids and et cetera. And I said, wow, well, you know, that could be the case. And thinking about just the challenges of life, just think about it. You know, you go on uh, social media and just, you know, how everybody, doesn't it annoy you how everybody just posts perfect pictures, all nice, etc. right? No? Well, maybe I'm just, yeah, it sometimes annoys me because I'm like, I know your life. <laughs> I just spoke to you. It ain't that good, right? But there's that pressure of always posting what's good and, ah, I got a raise and this is going well and that's going well. And that sometimes put pressure on us. And then there's the pressure of work. And I really didn't think about maybe Mr. Angry Walmart dad had a job that was not going well. Maybe he was frustrated at his work. Maybe he didn't even have a job. How much more pressure would that put on his life? And then maybe he was a part of a church and maybe the responsibilities of, of helping out at church and doing this and doing that and, and, and maybe being a, a Christian, I don't know if he was or not, but that can sometimes also add pressure on our lives. Not to mention the pressure of a relationship. Uh, he was in one and, you know, I assume the three, six kids there, two women, probably one of them was his wife. Um, and just the pressures of things maybe not always going well in that relationship. I said, well, and, and that was pressure on him. And I started to think about it and as I was writing this message, I said, well, maybe Mr. Angry Walmart man was really Mr. Beaten Up by Life Man. Maybe the reason he was so angry was a culmination of one thing after another after another in this responsibility. And it just led me to ask the question of myself, what, who am I when I break down? Who are you when life throws its curveballs at you? Are, are you, am I, Mr. Avoid Emotional Intimacy? Don't allow anybody inside. Men are especially um, problematic in this area because we just shut down. And we don't let anybody, our spouses, our family, kids, how's everything going, Dad? I'm fine. Oh, okay. Hey, honey, how was work? Good. Oh. And maybe we're just, it's just too much for us to deal with. 
Are you Mrs. Spend My Troubles Away? So your solution is Visa and MasterCard? And maybe that's how you deal with whatever is going on when life breaks down. Maybe you're Miss Blame Other People. It's always someone else's fault. Amen. Oh, mercy. <laughs> hmm? Maybe you're Mr. I don't care anymore. And as I got honest about who am I when I break down, I had to realize, yeah, you know, there were some times last year where that, that's who I was. I was, I was burnt out. There was just so many things going after me. And, da, 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 da. and I just, it got to the point where I was like, I don't care anymore. I'm done. I'm tired. I want to quit. Who are you when you break down? And I realized I was thinking about Mr. Angry Walmart, Dad. What, what, who was I and where was I and what did I need when I was broken down? I needed someone to love, accept, and encourage me not to judge me. Amen. And that's unfortunately exactly what I was doing to this man. I needed grace. I recommend that as we start out the year 2020, finishing up this month, to run the race of life at grace pace, not a work's pace. What does that really mean? Well, grace is the mercy and active love of God. Grace is the winsome attractiveness of God. Grace is the strength of God to overcome. I love this definition. Grace is everything for nothing to those who don't deserve anything. Grace is God stooping low to impart favor on undeserving mankind. That's what I needed. And that's what I need today. Let's look at a story real quick. One that we are familiar with. Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4 tells the story of creation and the story of life. And right after Adam and Eve sin. Tells a tragic story of their sons, Cain and Abel. It says here in, in Genesis chapter 4, Now the man had relations with his wife Eve and conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, I have gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. So tragically enough, Adam and Eve, after they sinned, God gave this commandment, or rather this, this promise in the previous chapter saying, he was going to send the Messiah. And so, you know, Eve, when, when she had gotten this boy, she's like, oh, Cain, may, maybe this is who God is going to use to save the world. How tragic it would be that that was so far from the truth. She said, I've gotten a man child with the help of the Lord. Again, she gave birth to her, his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of the flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So it came in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. <clears throat> Abel, on his part, also brought the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering, but for Cain, or but not for but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at your door. And its desire is for you. But you must master it. Cain and Abel both in a predicament, both needing grace. They had both sinned. They were both sinners. They had both broken God's law as a result of their choices. But the th good thing is grace provided them a way out of their problem. Grace said, I know you've messed up, but here's the way out. Here's what I want you to do. Cain and Abel, I want you to bring a sacrifice to me. Why? A sacrifice, a very specific sacrifice. God wanted him to bring a, a lamb, and, and not just any lamb, but a firstborn, a male, without any blemish. Because in the future, God was pointing them forward to ultimately Jesus, who would die for our sins. And he would be the one who took our place. He would get the punishment that we deserved. So God said, listen, I want you to recognize that I am going to send someone to die on your behalf, my son. But I want you to recognize that. And by recognizing that, bring an offering. Not just any kind of offering. The exact offering that I told you. Because the sin, um, the person who is going to pay for your sin is going to be very specific. And it's going to be very costly. And so that request was made. But Cain didn't 
want to follow that. Cain thought, well, I'll just give the best that I have. So he brought his fruit, and that didn't work. Abel allowed Jesus to shape and to change his heart. But Cain kept Jesus out and relied on his own abilities and effort. Abel ran the race of life at a grace pace. He accepted what Jesus had done on his behalf. And he let God change his heart and was obedient. But Cain ran the race of life at a works pace. He wanted to do his own doing. And even though it was a good intention, it was still his intentions instead of God's. So Abel's offering was accepted and Cain's offering was rejected. Well, let's see what happens next. We know the story. Genesis 4, 8. Cain told Abel his brother and... It came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Now, it didn't say that it happened right away. It says over time. Because God knows something about time. And the reason God gives us time is because he knew that time would reveal more of what was already in their hearts. You see, we cannot be inconsistent with who we are. Over time we eventually are going to be who exactly we are. So if you are loving and kind, if someone gives you time, that's all that you're going to see. Someone who's consistently loving and kind. Yeah, you may slip up here or there, but over time they'll say, yeah, that person's a loving, kind person. If you're a thief, sooner or later, what are you going to do? You're going to steal something, right? We cannot act in a way that is inconsistent with who we are over time. So notice what happened. Cain rejected God's grace first, then he rejected God's law. And as we look in our own lives, and, and oftentimes in this Christian walk, and maybe, maybe you grew up with a, a great proper understanding of how that works, but, but maybe you didn't, and, or maybe you heard something other than what was shared to you growing up. But here's what happens. When we reject God's grace, the next thing we reject is His law. When we reject God's law, our lives begin to unravel. See, somewhere along this Christian life, I thought, I thought that, well, we have to focus so much on trying to do the right things, to be the right people, but God makes it so clear, and as I've matured in my life, I realize the first thing we must reject is God's grace, the way out that he provides for us. And the only after we reject that do we then reject his law. Because if I don't want God's way out, I'm going to take my own way out. And any way out that's not God's way is going to lead to sin. I want us to remember this year, run the race of life at a grace pace, not a works pace. And I know that it's tempting because all around us, everybody's saying, hey, what have you done? What are your accomplishments? What things have you been able to do? And, and we're encouraged to apply our best efforts, etc. And that can sometimes lead to this idea that, well, if it's going to be, it's up to me. But Jesus says, no, 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 friend. When it comes to your salvation... It's up to me because I paid the price. Even before you were here, I knew the life that you would live. I knew the mistakes that you would make. And in my ability to see so far ahead of time, I said, I'm going to pay the price for Zach, whether he accepts me or not. I'm going to pay the price for Jody, whether she accepts me or not, because grace makes a way, even though knowing that the person may or may not accept that grace. Grace says, I still love him. So I'll still do it. If you look at a parent, one of the best pictures of grace, the things that a parent does for their children, and they don't, they don't ask for anything back. They do it simply because they love their child. Now, they hope their children will make good choices, and it hurts them when they don't make good choices. But if they had to do it all over again, any loving parent would say, I'd do it all again. I'd give up the job promotion. I'd give up that. I'd give up the house. I'd give up whatever. Anything for my kids because they love them that much. If we can make time with Jesus a daily priority, friends, Amen. then we will be able to live life at a grace pace. Let his love for you change your heart. Amen. I love Jeremiah 13, um, 23. It's a question that God asks. It's almost laughable. But he's trying to get a point across to us as we try to live life on this earth and he's saying, hey, listen, you can't do it your way. It doesn't work your way. 
In Jeremiah 13, 23, Jesus asks this rhetorical question about us and our ability to do good things. It says, Jeremiah 13, 23, can the Ethiopian <clears throat> change his skin or the leopards his spot? Of course they can't. Then he says, then you also can do good who are accustomed to, do, to doing evil. In other words, if it's possible for an Ethiopian to change his skin, then it's possible for you to do good who are used to doing evil. But it's impossible for an Ethiopian to change his skin or a leopard his spot. So in the same way, it's impossible for us who are so used to doing evil to doing good. So it can't be us who changes ourselves because we're not good at it. But Jesus offers an alternative. He says in Matthew eleven twenty eight, Come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. I don't know what you're dealing with this morning, what stressors are in your life, maybe the responsibilities of life, maybe as you're aging, your health isn't what it used to be, and you're just really worried and concerned, and, and you feel like taking things in your own hands, and maybe you already have taken things in your own hands, but Jesus is saying, man, you're going to get tired really quickly of holding life's problems in your own ability to handle them. He says, let me help you. I'll give you rest, is his promise. Ephesians 2.10, this is part of our scripture reading. Thank you for reading that, Myrna. Jesus says to us, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. And the question is, well, what exactly are those works? Because I thought what it used to mean was, well, we're supposed to focus on doing good things. Not being bad, staying out of trouble. But I learned that the work that we are to do, the privilege, is found in John 15, 1 through 5. And it's a whole different kind of work than what I thought it was. John 15, 1 through 5, talks about Jesus, and he's, this is his last discourse to his disciples before he dies. He says, I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me. And I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do what? Nothing. So, so the only work that I'm responsible is not the works of doing good. I'm not responsible for trying to keep God's law. I'm not able to. An Ethiopian can't change his skin. I'm used to doing bad things. I can't do good things consistently. It's against my nature. But Jesus says, if I connect with him, if I abide in him, the only work that we are responsible for is to spend time with Jesus. He gives us the power to produce good fruit. Fruit is important. Obedience is important. God's law is eternal. But I can't keep it on my own. So Jesus says, come stay a while with me. The Greek word for abide is the idea of putting up a tent and being in the tent with someone. And that's what Jesus says. He says, would you come and stay in a tent with me? As you go through life, would you walk with me? Would you invite me into your life in every decision that you make? Because as you do that, slowly but surely, your life will look more like Jesus' life. And people will start to say, hey, you used to do this, but you don't do it anymore. And you say, oh, that's interesting. Did you make a conscious effort to stop? No, not really. Well, what happened? Well, I kept spending time with Jesus, and he kept turning my heart towards him. And then I said, you know what? No, thank you. Because it's not one of those, ah, I'm going to try really hard. And oh, I did good today, boy. Because imagine that kind of effort in every decision. Because there's a lot of people out there that make you want to right, scream because they strangle them but that's not nice sometimes you want to right 
So Jesus says, listen, it's too much effort to write and love all these crazy people, us included. So he says, let me change your heart. Because when I change your heart, it's not work anymore. It's a natural outflow of who you are. So as I think back to Mr. Angry Walmart Dad, what would have been the work that would have come had I been spending more time inviting Jesus in my life? Because I spend time with Jesus every day. But the problem is sometimes is I spend time with him in the morning. I'm like, peace out, Jesus. I'm going to see you later. And Jesus is like, oh, okay, bye. And then I run into somebody who maybe needs some grace, but do I have any grace to give out? No, because Jesus is still at the house. He's not really, but in my heart he is because I didn't invite him along with me. So next time, by God's grace, I could say a prayer for him and say, wow, Lord, he must have a lot of challenges. Please give him strength. I could have spoken an encouraging word to him. Say, hey, brother, man, thanks for being a great dad. I know you're doing your best. The truth of the matter for me, friends, is my heart looks like Cain's heart more often than I'd like to admit. Because we read these Bible stories of maybe the, the good person and the person that was maybe not so good, not realizing that they both needed God's grace equally. The thing is, God knew Cain's heart and still extended his grace to him. That gives me hope because when I'm in those Cain-like moments and I'm relying on my own strength, on my gut, my determination, my willpower, Jesus says, Daniel, you are acting a fool, but I still got you. You're my fool. I died for you, and I've got you covered. And he extends that grace to me. So the question for us, friends, this week is, how can I let God's grace shine through my life this week? Because there's going to be a moment, probably more than a moment, that you need him. And the action that happens right in that moment of showtime is going to be predicated on the time that you have spent with him and whether he is walking with you. And if he is, then by his grace, you'll make the right choice. And if not, then you'll be asking for forgiveness, saying, Lord, I messed up again. And you know he's going to say? The same thing in the same opportunity he gave to Cain, he gave to Abel. He says, man, my son, I'm here for you. It's okay. I've got you. I died for you. I love you. Let's try again. So friends, let's remind ourselves this week, run the race of life at a grace pace, not a works pace. What does that mean? It means focus on the relationship, relationship with Jesus, the number one, the only thing that will take us through life at a grace pace. We've learned through this series, friends, in January, don't let good things get in the way of God things. To be successful in our Christian journey, we've got to look at things using God's perspective. And today, to run the race of life at a grace pace, not a works place. And I thank God for that little puppy dog, because it reminds me of me. And that's all of God's grace. It's there for you every time you need it. And even in eternity, we will need God's grace. If you know that there's an area of your life that you're like, yeah, Lord, I woo, need some grace in that area. Let's bow your heads, just lift up your hands and say, Jesus, yes, Lord, I recognize I don't have it all together and I need your help to run life's race at a grace pace. Jesus, our hands, mine being the first, are raised. We need you in our lives, in our marriages, in our homes, in our churches, at our places of work, at our, with our children, and we're desperate. <clears throat> But sometimes we're stuck on self and we feel like we can do it all on our own. So please remind us, Jesus, to run life's race at a grace pace. And Father, when we mess up, because it's bound to happen, help us to stay connected to you. Not to beat ourselves up because we messed up. But Jesus, by looking to you, slowly but surely, our life will be one with yours. So that when carrying out our own impulses, it will be doing your work. That's our prayer. In Jesus' name. Amen.
what a privilege it has been to learn from the Lord today and to worship together. And until we meet again next week, let these words ring in your ears. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace both now and forevermore. Amen. We'll see you next week.